Okay, we have started the recording. Um, I am Chris Marone. I'm very happy to welcome you to the Monday seminars. Um, and um, this week we are lucky to have Corinto Noir with us um, from uh, from Nice, from Jerusalem. And um, he is going to tell us about some really interesting things that he's been doing there in the last year or so. Um, uh, I suspect you're not new, but in case if, if you're new, welcome. Um, our normal mode of operation is to ask people to mute at the beginning and then to feel free to unmute and ask us a simple question, point of clarification along the way. At the end, we have uh, often up to 30 minutes of time for an extended discussion and question and answer period that we want everyone to participate in. So, yeah, please be prepared to participate and um, and especially if you have some point of clarification along the way. Sometimes that's useful because as you all know by Zoom, it's a little bit boring sometimes to just talk into your screen and not see anyone. So uh, I think Corentin wouldn't mind being interrupted for something along the way. Okay. Yeah, no, please uh, interrupt me. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much Corentin for organizing this and uh, looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. So yes, please feel free to interrupt me if something is um, not clear. Uh, I would be very happy to clarify if I can. So today I will present you um, some data that I uh, acquired in Joe Azure, uh, so across from Nice, uh, with Cédric Twardzik, uh, Pierre Dublanchet and François Pasleg on the, the role of frictional heterogeneities on the seismic cycle, and it will be a laboratory uh, perspective. So everything was done in the lab, and it was um, uh, uh, sponsored by an ERC that is uh, earned by François Pasleg that is called HOPE. So first, let's, uh, uh, I will present you a small introduction on the seismic cycle. I guess everyone knows that. But uh, so here I'm showing you the slip uh, on the fault as function of depth uh, for a different phase of the seismic cycle. Uh, here you have a time scale that presents you how long does this phase last. So first you have uh, an interseismic phase during which you have some part of the fault that are creeping um, and some other part, as you can see here, uh, that are completely locked or uh, that sleep at much uh, lower rate. And those lock parts, they do accumulate stress uh, over time during this phase. And once you have a stress that is high enough, you can start uh, to nucleate. Uh, so you have a small patch that starts to nucleate here. And if this patch um, uh, grows uh, up to a, a certain length, so a critical length, you may uh, have a, a an earthquake, so a very fast uh, and large slip that occurs on your fault. Um, so you have a large co-seismic phase, a large displacement that occurs very rapidly on a, a large part of the fault. And on this diagram, you can see that uh, some part of this fault, of this uh, imaginary fault, are uh, still have a slip deficit here that, so that it needs to be retrieved to 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 fully have a complete cycle uh, earthquake cycle and this uh, slip deficit is retrieved usually uh, during a post seismic phase that uh, occur or at least is regi registered after large seismic events and uh, the deformation on this part of the fault can occur in many ways so it can be uh, through aftershocks, uh, viscoelastic relaxation of part of the uh, deeper uh, fault, some poroelastic deformation, and uh, some aseismic slip that is very often called after slip in the literature that are uh, on the fault plane. So today I'm gonna uh, mainly discuss uh, this uh, aseismic slip, so this after slip. So I will present you a bit the history of this. Um, of this uh, after slip. So it was first uh, documented after Parkfield 1966 earthquakes. Uh, as you can see here, you have uh, a relative displacement measured by GNSS uh, station, different station are here as function of time. And you can see that uh, those stations are moving, so the fault is moving uh, and they accumulate displacement over time. First you have very large accumulation of displacement and then the displacement rate decreases uh, with time. So you have long-lasting uh, di uh, displacement after the earthquake 
that they accumulate more or less linearly with the uh, logarithm of the time. And they can release very large, large displacement that can have uh, a moment that has, uh, that has as large as the co-seismic uh, moment. Another uh, example is, for example, here a map view of Sumatra uh, subduction zone. And you have here the contour that are um, the co-seismic slip contour that were inverted. And you have the color map uh, in reddish, yellowish, that is uh, the after slip that occur uh, after this uh, large uh, Sumatra 20, uh, 2007 earthquake. And you can see that in this map view, uh, where you have the most, uh, the largest after slip is at places where you didn't have any uh, co seismic slip before. before. So you have mainly uh, after slip around the co seismic rupture. And one other thing that you can note on this figure is that you have the focal mechanism that are uh, presented here, uh, that are the uh, aftershock sequences. And they are mainly located on uh, the, the patch where you have the most uh, uh, large accumulation of aftersleep. Another way of seeing this uh, aftersleep and aftershock um, uh, correlation is uh, to plot here, uh, uh, it was done by Perfettini and Avoac um, uh, after Landers uh, earthquake 1992. You have, uh, as a function of time, you have in black the normalized post seismic deformation, and in gray you have the cumulative, cumulative number of aftershock that follow exactly the same train. So it was uh, uh, it, it was uh, thought to be that the after uh, after sleep is one of the main main driving mechanism of uh, aftershocks. So to summarize, after sleep is a long lasting uh, aseismic sleep that occur on area where you didn't have any uh, co-seismic rupture. Uh, but what are the mechanism of after sleep? Why don't we have just uh, a prolongation of the co-seismic rupture to a larger extent? So there, there's different uh, possible mechanism that were um, uh, cited in the literature. So the first one is a stress heterogeneity, so that the, the, the place where you have after sleep has a too, uh, too low stress to propagate uh, your, se your seismic rupture. You can have uh, heterogeneous uh, fluid pressure dif distribution, so that when you have an earthquake, you change your pore pressure condition, and then after the earthquake, you recharge your fault in, in fluid or, or, or so, and you favor uh, a seismic sleep. You can have uh, other mechanisms such as a residual geometrical moment. And the one that is the mostly uh, used is frictional heterogeneity, so that your, your part of your fault is stable and part of your fault is uh, unstable. Anyway, all those mechanisms are all linked with one thing, is that they are all uh, linked with heterogeneities, and which is a good point because this is our uh, actual view of, of, of fault. So here you have an example of um, a subduction zone where you where is uh, it's differentiated in different domains, where you can have, for example, in red here uh, seismic patches that are embedded into uh, conditionally stable uh, zones, or um, some seismic patches into uh, a seismic uh, zones, or here another view from uh, from Cristiano where you have uh, seismic patches that are uh, strong, that are um, embedded into a, a much weaker matrix uh, that is also uh, a seismic. So um, our view of natural fault is that they are heterogeneous and they uh, produce seismic cycles that are uh, complex with interseismic uh, period that can last long rapid co-seismic period, afterward you have some post-seismic deformation, and so on and so forth. However, in the laboratory, uh, except for some very, very recent studies uh, in the past two or three years, we mainly study very homogeneous faults. So this is a simplified view, but mainly we study uh, one default that are uh, composed of a, of a uh, that are uh, that are very homogeneous, and what we produce is a seismic cycle that is much simpler, with interseismic uh, period and then a co-seismic period, and then 
either we don't measure it or we don't see it, but we don't have any post-seismic uh, post phase. And so we have just interseismic and co-seismic phase. And one question here is that can we uh, complexify our laboratory seismic cycle just by adding uh, heterogeneities? So today I will try to uh, convince you that we can. And uh, I will try to answer uh, this uh, simple question. So can we get closer to natural fault seismic cycle by just adding uh, frictional heterogeneities? So to answer that to that question, we uh, perform some laboratory experiments. Sorry, um, in a triaxial device, so we have cylinder uh, sample with socket uh, fault that are composed of two materials. So they are composed of uh, granite, as you can see on the left side here, that when you uh, have a granite fault in the lab, here it's westerly granite, you have the differential stress as, as function of strain, and you can see that it produced tick slip, so we have an uh, earthquake in the laboratory. And on the uh, right hand side, you have a marble fault. And what a marble fault does, at least in the condition at which we tested, is that you have a continuous creep on your, uh, on your fault. So, so we have an aseismic behavior on the marble fault and a seismic behavior on the granite fault. And what we did is that we did a combination of granite uh, with marble uh, fault. So we did a fault where we have a, a marble asperity that is embedded into a granite, uh, a granite uh, fault and a granite asperity into a marble fault. So then during the following of the talk, I will present you those faults as using the small symbols. So uh, this is a the plain view as you can see here so this is the two sides of the fault and you see that for example this one is a granite on top of a granite this one is a granite on top of a granite with a marble asperity a granite with a, on top of a marble with a granite asperity b material experiment so granite on top of marble and marble on top of marble Point that. <coughs> yes very quick question um how deep are are these uh, little pieces in the center they are the, the length of the fault. So we, ah, so it's a full core. Understood, thank you. So, so this will be the schematic that I will use mainly during the talk. So then we take these uh, folds, these cylinders, and we place them into a triaxial device that is installed here in Geo Azure. So you have here uh, the actual piston, here is the confining chamber that is closed during the experiment, and here is a zoom of a picture during uh, just before that we close the, the vessel, just before the experiment, so you have the sample here that is inside the jacket, and here is a cross-section view, so you have the sample, the fault is at 30 degrees from the uh, actual stress, which is our sigma 1, and the entire uh, entire uh, assembly is put into confining oil that provide a confining pressure to the sample uh, during the, the experiment. Um, this is a small view of the sensors that we have on the fault. So in, uh, in a 3D representation, so you have our fault that, are, that is here. And around our fault, we glued uh, eight strain gauges that provide local measurement of strain close to the fault. And they were all oriented uh, parallel to the actual stress, so to the, the sigma one. We also had uh, acoustic sensors, as you can see here uh, on, the, on the picture of the sample. But for today's talk, I will not uh, discuss too much this, uh, this data. Um, so then the, the, the procedure that we use, so you have here the stress or the pressure as function of time. And this is a full experiment on the, on the sample that we, that we did. So first we apply a confining pressure of 30 MPa uh, and we increase the axial stress by uh, advancing the axial piston down that increase the axial stress and then we produce some seismic cycle. Then we decrease this axial stress, increase the confining pressure to 60 MPa, increase the, the, the axial stress, produce some seismic cycle. Then we increase again the confining pressure to 90 MPa. We did some seismic cycle, and then we went down to 60 and 30 MPa. For all this uh, sequence, the piston 
and the far field was advanced slowly at 1.4 micron per second. As you can see here, here is a zoom on uh, this uh, experiment of this section of the experiment. And you can see in blue the actual uh, piston that is advancing and during the seismic cycle is, it's jumping. And during the test, the confining pressure is constant. So for the 95% of the talk, I will just talk about those three steps where we increase the confining pressure. And then in the discussion, I will uh, come back to those two uh, descending uh, confining pressure uh, experiments. So let's jump into the results. Let me have a quick drink. So this is the macroscopic results. So this is the shear stress as a function of time. For the typical experiment that we did, going on the right, you increase the confining pressure from 30 to 90 MPa. And uh, I will show you some, um, some different faults. So this is the uh, grind grind fault. You can see that you have interseismic period, say, uh, say, uh, shear stress drop, uh, and so on and so forth. So we are producing um, earthquakes, and the uh, shear stress drop amplitude seems to increase uh, with the confining pressure. For uh, the uh, marble uh, fault, what we have is that the fault is fully creeping during the entire experiment, so we are fully uh, seismic. And then, um, so the more complex faults. So this is the uh, marble asperity. What you have is that you have a seismic, uh, uh, you have seismic events, so you have shear stress drop, but their amplitude is much smaller than when you don't have uh, this uh, marble asperity. Then if we have uh, granite asperity, so much more uh, marble content in that fault, you also decrease again the, um, the, the shear stress drop. And finally, uh, for the B material experiment, you have uh, again a seismic uh, behavior, but with the smallest shear stress drop that we, we record. So macroscopically, the higher is the confining pressure, the higher is the uh, macroscopic stress drop. So this is expected. This was uh, studied much before. And then uh, the higher the marble content in our case, the lower uh, is the macroscopic shear stress drop. For so what about, yes? Sorry to interrupt again. I, I missed the angle, 30 degrees from sigma 1. What is it? Yeah, 30 degrees from sigma 1. And also the poor fluid conditions? Uh, there's fluids or? Zero. No, no, no. It's all dry. And, and it's really like chemically dry or it's just kind of room dry humidity? A room dry, yeah. Yeah, under things. And? Yeah. Uh, no, I'll wait. Maybe you'll say something about it later. Thanks. As you want. <laughs> okay. So what about the local strain? So this is the, the, the interesting uh, measurements is the strain gauges. So I'm going to show you two representations. So this is an example of one seismic event uh, on the granite granite fault. So here you have the strain gauge location on one side of the fault and the color of the point here represent where is uh, the color of the curve. So for example, this blue strain gauge recorded this, this strain. And here it's inelastic strain. So it was distrended from the elasticity. So just to have um, uh, inelastic deformations. And for uh, simplicity, just to start for the first few, few slides, I will present you two strain gauges only. So the orange one and the blue one that are the fifth and the second. And they were chosen because very often the, uh, the strain gauge number five has the largest co-seismic uh, strain drop and the uh, number two has the smallest one. We will see after what, why, why we chose this one. So now I'm presenting you the result just for uh, 90 MP of confining pressure because it's the one that uh, where we see uh, the most the, the result, but it's, it's the same for all the confining pressure. So this is the uh, inelastic strain drop for the uh, marble uh, for the granite granite fault for those two uh, strain gauge of interest, and you can see that after a departure from elasticity, so you may you you nucleate an event that propagates. Uh, downward, you will see afterward, and then you have a, a, a strain drop that is uh, fast on all the strain gauges. When you have 
a marble asperity now, you can see that on this orange strain gauge, the inelastic strain drops start to deviate, similarly to, uh, to what the blue was doing on the granite fault. And then on the other side, you can see that uh, the, the strain gauge accumulates. However, when you have the, the shear strain drop on uh, the strain drop on the on the orange one, the strain drops everywhere on the fault. But you have this orange uh, uh, strain gauge that has a very fast strain drop and a small, a slower one on this blue strain gauge. When you have uh, Granite asperity, this starts to be uh, much funnier. Um, you have on this orange strain gauge, you have a very fast strain drop. And on the other side uh, of the fault, on this blue strain gauge, you have a very large strain increase. And afterward, you have a very, very slow strain decay that occurs over a few seconds. And finally, for this uh, B material uh, fault, so granite against uh, marble, you have again a fast strain drop on this orange uh, strain gauge and on the other side of the fault you have a very large strain decay uh, strain increase and then a very large strain decay and you can see that here the, the co-seismic strain, strain drop on this orange is much smaller than when you have a, uh, an asperity and Carter, so, there's, there's yeah. no intrinsic there's no intrinsic asymmetry in this sample is that right i mean there's no reason yeah. to yeah. there's no symmetry on, no, the, on the fault, yeah. There, there's no reason to expect the blue and the from the from the geometry of the experiment to expect the blue to be different than the orange, right? If the, if no. they're 180, yeah. No, no, no. Yep. But, uh, if, yes, there is because the so as they are um, elongated faults, so the the strain gauge that are around here are closer to the asperity than the one that are far here. But for the but the blue and the orange. They're almost 180 degrees apart, not, not exactly. Not exactly, but almost, yeah. Yeah, okay. So what those two strain gauges tell us is that fast and specially extended strain drop are often happening close to the, uh, the asperity. So this, this orange is actually closer to, to the asperity than the blue one. Um, uh, so the so the fast and specially extend and specially extended strain drop occur close to the granite granite contacts, and in the marble, the strain is mainly accommodated through uh, long term uh, decay afterward. So so this is what we will call from now on after slip that occur on our fault. So now, if we look at all the strain uh, strain gauges together. So this is the granite um, uh, granite fault. You can see that uh, you start to nucleate an event uh, on this uh, greenish uh, strain gauge, so around here, and it propagates downward up to reaching uh, critical lengths, and afterward you have a very large strain drop on all the strain gauges. So all the slip here is accommodated through a co-seismic event. Now, if we look at the um, uh, marble asperity, what you have is that uh, you have a deviation from elasticity here. So you have a nucleation that should be around uh, these strain gauges, that is the orange one. And then you have, uh, you have a much smaller extension of this uh, nucleation patch, and you have a strain drop uh, that occurs everywhere but uh, in some part that are far from this nucleation point, it's slower, but everything is still co-seismic. All the slip occur co-seismically. Now, if you look at uh, the, the, the most interesting fault, I think, uh, the, so the, the granite asperity, what you have is that you have uh, this strain drop that occur close to this orange one orange strain gauge here. And on the other side, you, you have very large increase of strain, uh, also on this red one, and then a very long strain decay. So what you have is, it seems that the center part, part of the fault occur, uh, seems to have a, a displacement that is accumulated only during the co-seismic event. And the external part, so the top part and the bottom part, mainly during a post-seismic slip. 
And finally, for this uh, B material fault, you have similar uh, behavior as before. So you have a uh, departure of elasticity, then a, a fast train drop on this orange one and uh, this green one, but all the other uh, seem to, uh, to, do, to accumulate uh, uh, the strain drop afterward, after this event, so in the post-seismic event. So we have, again, a partition of uh, the, the slip during the co- and the post-seismic uh, uh, phase. So it seems that the co-seismic and the post-seismic strain release are separated not only in time, but also in space. This is also what I showed you in the introduction on the Sumatra, uh, after Sumatra earthquake, you have the post-seismic deformation that occurs around the co-seismic uh, ruptures. And another way of seeing that uh, more clearly, or, or not, I don't know, for me more clearly, is, is to plot the inelastic strain as a function of time, and we picked on the, on the strain gauge the initiation of the fast strain drop, so this is very zoomed, as you can see the time, and uh, the moment where uh, we stop to have a fast strain drop, and we call that the uh, co-seismic uh, period, the co-seismic uh, phase. And here, what I plot you is an example of this. So we have in red the co-seismic strain drop as function of the radial position on the uh, of the strain gauge on, your, on our fault. And you can see that uh, in red, this co-seismic uh, strain drop, you have, po -seismic, uh, you have positive co-seismic strain drop that are when you have a strain drop that is occurring, and you have negative one where you have strain drop that, that increase because your fault is locked. And if you do the same for the uh, post-seismic, so the blue one, so you pick the, the end of the co-seismic and when the strain gauge uh, goes back to zero, uh, you have the post-seismic uh, strain release, and you can see that when this post when the the co-seismic strain drop is uh, zero or negative, you have large post-seismic deformation. Whereas when you have uh, positive and large co-seismic slip, you have almost no post-seismic deformation. So this is another way of seeing uh, the separation in time and space. Uh, of the post-seismic, co-seismic deformation in our sample. And you can do that at all the confining pressure for all the events. So one line is one event. And you can see that when the red is high, the blue is low. And when the blue is high, the red is low. So it means that uh, when you have large co-seismic, you have uh, no post-seismic. And we have when you have a low co-seismic close to this um, when you have low co-seismic, you have high, large uh, post-seismic. And it works uh, similarly with this uh, B-material fault also, especially at high confining pressure. So co-seismic and post-seismic are separated in time and space, uh, similarly to what we observe in a natural system. So now I will focus a bit more uh, in detail on one strain gauge, which is this blue one. Uh, because it's the one that sees the most post-seismic deformation, so it's easier to analyze. Uh, and I will use a classical method that are done uh, usually using uh, GNSS data, but on uh, our strain gauge measurements. So this is uh, this blue strain gauge, so strain gauge number two. Now it's reversed, so everything is positive. Uh, this is the accumulated post-seismic strain during the post-seismic uh, phase as a function of time. And you can see so that it's uh, increased log linearly with, with time. And um, we try to fit our data uh, using rate and state um, approximation, using rate and state, the rate and state framework. And it tells you that uh, the strain accumulated during the post-seismic deformation uh, is a function of the initial strain rate, so the initial strain that occurs at the very beginning of the post-seismic, and a critical time, a function of the critical time and the logarithm of this critical time. And this critical time depends on a uh, few parameters, so the normal stress, the rate and state parameter A minus B, uh, stiffness parameter, so in our case, uh, the stiffness is normalized by this uh, big K uh, to take into account because we are in strain, but this, this formulation is in slip, 
So now it's to, it's to turn the, this equation into strain and uh, uh, again this uh, initial uh, strain rate. So what is, what is good with experiments is that uh, on this equation we have everything. We have the normal stress, we measure it, uh, we have the stiffness, we can estimate uh, this parameter using uh, a numerical simulation, we can measure the initial uh, strain rate. The only thing that we don't have is this uh, A minus B. So we can try to invert this A minus B uh, as function of uh, the different condition that we have. So this is what we did. So we use this equation first to fit the data and to retrieve our T0 and, and we measure our initial strain rate. And this is the, uh, an example of the fitting. So you can see that uh, the, data, the data are pretty well fitted with these equations. So it seems that, uh, that we can use this equation to, to explain our data. So now I'm going to show you the T0 and the A minus B that, that we obtain using this equation for all the uh, different uh, events that we have. So first, here you have a T0 as a function of the measured uh, initial strain rate. So you can see that increasing the normal stress or the confining pressure, which they are directly, directly relate, related, uh, you have an increase of the initial strain rate measured. And T0 seems to be relatively constant for all the tested uh, conditions. What you can see also on this graph, those lines, are uh, the T0 as function of the uh, uh, initial strain rate using this uh, equation for different normal stress, which are the one that we uh, impose to our sample. And you can see that to fit more or less our data, we need to change this A minus B. And if we invert the A minus B for all the events, this is what we have. We have here the A minus B, that is, so we call it A minus B star because it's we call it an apparent A minus B as function of the post seismic strain. And the color bar here is the uh, normal stress. So you can see that when you increase the confining pressure or the normal stress, you increase your post seismic strain and you also increase uh, your A minus B. So the fault property that we invert, so this apparent A minus B seems to increase with uh, the normal stress. So this is, this is cool because Potentially, we are sleeping on a marble fault at this, during this post-seismic uh, phase. And what you can see in the literature is that uh, so marble is composed of, of, uh, of calcite, is that calcite gouge have an A minus B frictional parameter that also increases with increasing the normal stress and in the uh, similar range as what we have. So it seems that the apparent A minus B that we measure are correlated with the A minus B. Yes? The, I, I missed, or you didn't say, the different symbols on your plots, on this one and the, and the slide before, what, what were they? No, I think you are muted, Corentin. You are muted. You lost, your, you lost your voice somehow when you went back. Maybe you hit the audio, the mute button. No. <laughs> uh oh, sorry. Me now? Yes, yes. Yes. Sir. And the slide before this, or on this yeah. one, the different symbols, what do they represent for your data? So the, the I forgot to put the legend here. The triangles are the, the granite asperity fault, and the circle are the marble on the granite. Ah, very cool. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, and, and the, so the, the triangles are this one, and the circles are this one. And the rate and state friction parameters you ended up with uh, the the modeling are all uh, velo most, all velocity strengthening and are related to the marble uh, a minus b frictional properties. Yes, so they are all positive, but because in this law you impose that it is it must be positive using this law. But yes, okay. they are all positive. Uh, so yeah, so our apparent A minus B seem to be related directly or not directly, but it's approximately similar to the A minus B of the rate and state. 
And then, so yeah, so then I told you that during our experiment, we also did, so we increased the confining pressure and then we decrease it uh, slowly. So we did the same uh, inversion for all the confining pressure. So when we were decreasing, so we, uh, during our experiment, we increased the confining pressure, our A minus B increases, our post seismic uh, strain increases. And then what happened if we decrease? Do we follow still this line or not? So what happened is that uh, now uh, you have again T0 as function of uh, initial uh, strain rates. And the small symbols here that are transparent are the increasing confining pressure and the full symbol uh, not transparent are uh, when you decrease the confining pressure. And what you can see is that it's very different now. Um, first, your T0 is no longer constant. It seems that uh, the higher the confining pressure, the lower is T0. And it seems that the, the initial strain rate is all the, always uh, uh, the initial strain rate is higher again at high normal stress. So what you have now, if you add those points, so to your uh, well, uh, a minus b as function of post seismic strain, are those points here? Uh, is that you have uh, your a minus b that has increases as function of strain, as function of uh, in, when you increase the confining pressure. And then when you decrease the confining pressure, you go uh, leftward. So it seems that your A minus B, your apparent A minus B is not evolving anymore, but that um, uh, that your fault has a, a property that don't evolve anymore. So yeah, so you increase uh, the confining pressure and then you decrease the confining pressure. So your fault full property seems to have in memory what it has experienced at high confining pressure and it's not evolving anymore. And uh, what you can see, if you take all those points and you multiply your apparent A minus B by the normal stress that you record, you collapse, here you have the legend, Chris, sorry. <laughs> you collapse all your points uh, together. And it seems that uh, the post seismic strain uh, is a direct function of this uh, product that is our A minus B that is apparent times uh, the uh, normal stress. So the post seismic strain amplitude scale with this uh, normal stress times uh, apparent uh, A minus B. And this is my, uh, my conclusion. So I hope I convince you that we can do much more complex uh, earthquake cycles in the lab by adding heterogeneity. And I think it's the first evidence of uh, large after sleep in the laboratory, at least on socket uh, triaxial interface. Um, it seems that after sleep can emerge from simple frictional heterogeneities. This after sleep occur on areas that, that are devoted of co-seismic sleep or that where you have much less co-seismic sleep. So you have a separation between co-seismic and post-seismic uh, deformation in space and time. Uh, this is well explained, this post-seismic phase after sleep is well explained by the rate and state. And it seems that to have very large after sleep, you need a large normal stress and a large uh, apparent A minus B. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful talk. Thank you. I invite people to unmute. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. Nice talk. And um, okay, while he's catching his breath, I'll just remind you at the bottom of your screen, you have a little feature that looks like that. It's probably the easiest way, often is the easiest way for us to organize questions. So yeah, please raise your hand and participate in the discussion, and uh, I only raised my hand to show it, so I'm gonna let Massimo Coco go first. Uh, thank you, Quarantine, very inspiring uh, talk, uh, thanks. I have two questions. The first question is, uh, you don't see any, so you, you have SOCAT, and therefore you don't see any localization of the strain. So you assume that the strain is always localized on the assumed precat on the full surface. Do you, you do you, do you see any damage on the sample or uh, 
the deviation for this uh, completely localized strain? So, so to test that we did so on the marble marble fault. What we did is you, we put a strain gauge uh, also far from it. Or what you see is that if you measure the strain at your LVDT, so that measure. Uh, so, so your question is: Do we have deformation in the bulk or just at the interface? No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so first macroscopically we don't see any evidence. So the sample is not barreling. So it seems that we have everything on the, on our fault, and then if you record the um, the deformation with the LVDT that are measuring everything, and the the strain gauge that are measuring close to the fault but in the bulk, uh, you don't see any difference. So it seems that everything is occurring on our fault, and if not, I would say that ninety nine point five percent is at least occurring on the fault. Okay, so okay. this means that any preparation you know, before uh, the, the seismic stage, uh, it is uh, heterogeneous uh, nucleation on the fold. Okay. Yes. The second question is, uh, did you uh, compute the stiffness of your system? Perhaps yes. I, you mentioned and I didn't catch. So, the, so we measured the stiffness of, so the apparatus is known and also locally with each strain gauge. So when we do this, this inversion, this, this K parameter here is the local, uh, local stiffness measure at the strain gauge. Because I think that, that uh, the parameter that you just shown in the last slide, uh, it should scale with the stiffness, no? Uh, at least the strain. On, on A minus B sigma N. Potentially yes. At least, at least if you if you are extremely stiff, you would you would have nothing. So, I guess that there's a scaling here. Yeah. I can check. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Christiana, go ahead, and then um, again re uh, reemphasize the importance. Join in. Raise your hand. Go ahead, Christiana. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and thanks, uh, current and very. Very interesting talk and uh, very good data set and also very good analysis. And yeah, I was thinking that uh, yeah, most of the after sleep seems to be controlled by the frictional properties of the of the marble. So I was wondering if uh, you you develop some uh, gouge within the the sliding surface uh, marble gouge that is the weaker material that uh, can. Uh, affect this uh, after sleep controlled by marble and also if uh, you observe 